I'm so happy today to have Sergeant Aaron Schmaltz here. Thanks for coming, man. Appreciate you. Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to start with kind of recapping. I know you went to Portugal mm -hmm. on this trip. And I guess my understanding is like that's to kind of see how they're dealing with dr uh, drug addiction and right. that kind of thing. Um, tell me a little bit about that and like what the takeaways were from that. Sure. I mean, so the origin of the trip um, and me going, um, you know, we're having all these conversations about Measure 110 and just how to navigate addiction um, and specifically kind of the health portion of it. Measure 110 in Oregon was was less at its origins about health and more about concerns about disproportionate policing. Um, of certain communities, but um, uh, I've been working with some folks looking at pilots and other things. And so um, they invited me to go um, and kind of the the thesis of the trip was really just like, what what did they do? How'd they get there? And how does it work? And how does it not, basically? Um, their process is all the way back to 2000, 2001 era. They had a significant uh, heroin problem, something in the range of 1% of their population was using heroin. Um, and so just culturally, it was a significant issue and a lot of disease spread, HIV epidemic, all the things. And so there was a lot of cultural acquiescence around the need for change. Um, and I mean, it, like basically everyone had a family member who was struggling, which honestly, as we've kind of gotten into fentanyl, they don't have fentanyl there, but sort of similar here. Um, and so, you know, we get there and we're looking at all these different things. What, what became very clear to me very quickly is they have a whole of government approach. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you look at, at the model we have in America and particularly in Oregon, we have a lot of CBOs, a lot of nonprofits that kind of help us navigate our government spaces. But they're not, I mean, they're financially connected to what we do, but they're not. Like, it's not a first party. Kind right. Of, yeah. Um, whereas, I mean, all, I mean, Portugal is a small country. Um, their police is entirely federalized. Mm -hmm. Like it's just all, I mean, you just think about the state police basically running everything, um, but it's the government, um, the federal government. Um, and so, and there's this group called SICAD, as, <clears throat> excuse me, S-I-C-A-D that runs basically their entire approach to addiction okay. and the police are there, the treatment special. I mean, everyone is responsive to this, this individual group. Um, and we just, I mean, we don't have that level yeah. of cooperation. Yeah. And so, um, you know, they also have, uh, they have no guns and they have, again, I mentioned no fentanyl and their meth is not the kind of meth that we have here. So, um, it's quite, it, a, quite a bit different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, honestly, like it was really interesting. I think for me, just culturally, if you take a step back and just look at the way that their, their, their humans interact with the government, interact with law enforcement. Um, there were a lot of takeaways there that just, you know, Everyone understands their role. Everyone understands where those roles overlap. Um, and I think that's where we failed the most here. Hmm. And was that the first time you'd gone or? To Portugal? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For some reason, I thought that there was like a previous trip where a bunch of people went. But I, I think I'm just thinking of like they modeled a lot of yeah. 110 after yeah, I don't or something. Or... I don't. I would argue that that's not true okay. um, because yeah. if they did, they didn't model it after right. Portugal. I mean, so, cause again, what's it's, so important for me, you know, you always kind of have this argument of you want to begin where you want to end. The origin of measure 110 was kind of, um, it was came through, it was voted in 2020. There was a lot of conversations around disproportionate policing, the war on drugs, having, you know, too many people uh, in jail or being imprisoned for addiction. Um, and so there was a, a bit of the health approach, but in Portugal, it, it purely was that. Mm. Um, and they did it in cooperation with law enforcement. You know, the uh, there was multiple bills, something in the range of 20 bills. They spent two to three years bringing their system up. Um, that is not what happened here. Um, and from my perspective, that it was not the model. Mm -hmm. um, it's just completely like apples and carrots. It's not even the same genre. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, it's just important to make sure we're, we're having the same conversation about origins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. There's so many like differences that I just think of. Of you know, I had uh, I think Eli, you know, Eli Arnold. That yeah. guy, I had him on here, but he was saying you know just how vastly different like different states can be, obviously, and then the Ninth Circuit, all yeah. these different circuit rules, and and it's you know having a republic, democratic republic, you can see how rules are just so different across yeah. the country that it's hard to get like one unifying kind of thing like that but yeah uh, and it, it, a lot of it too comes down to values and i don't mean that in like the like you know like the good versus bad but more just like culturally when you look at different areas and it's funny like i have friends who have moved to different places in the country you know during 2020 people were like i don't want to live here but i want to live there because i think their values align with mine but culture is so deep and complicated mm -hmm. um it's just it's really really hard to like look at different places and say like we can do that or right. we can do this or adopt those kinds of things because I mean, even again, 
like to me it all comes down to societal accord it comes down to what are the values of where you're at you know what what kind of activity do people support from the government um and the other thing i mean look at, at portugal in in like 75 or so they were they literally had a dictator and it got really? yeah and it got overthrown um and then they kind of like were this new sort of democracy kind of uh form of government but so many people didn't trust the government because mm -hmm. you know you had like political police and yeah, people and this were kind is of twenty five years ago or whatever yeah. right it's not well yeah uh, forty loader yeah yeah, yeah but whatever um, but uh, what was interesting to me when we spoke with their law enforcement I was like well how did you guys get buy in um, you know moving out of that kind of form of government mm -hmm. and it was through law enforcement um, in the early eighties. Um, they created a whole community policing model that really leaned heavily on school police. It leaned heavily on mm. creating relationships and being accessible, um, which as a police officer was really refreshing to me because I know that when we have relationship with our community, when we have access and that is a symbiosis, then you end up really being able to build together. Um, and a lot of that is what was broken in 2020 is mm. was relationship. And so um, it was really refreshing to see such a progressive country be so focused on relationship. Um, and you heard from some of the police officers there that more recently you're starting to see some of that breakdown, um, mm. people not wanting to have such a deep relationship with law enforcement. And that as a result, they're starting to see crime rise, having more issues. Mm. And so it's like you see the origin where how do we fix it? We fix it through relationship. And then you also see the other side where if relationship breaks down, it starts to get worse. And so um, I think it's pretty clear from a case study standpoint with Portugal that that they lean heavily and require a relationship for their system to function. Mm -hmm. um, and we need that here too. Yeah. Yeah. It does seem critical. It's funny because one thing I've been, I mean, it's been talked about for like decades, but I, when I was younger, I used to be this kind of more anti-police person who was like, I'm sure you've heard it a million times where like, we need police officers should be required to live in city limits. This sure. whole thing of, and even when I was in my 20s, I looked in it and I'm like, this seems like really unconstitutional, first of all, like if you can make it to your job, like that's fine. And if you have that relationship with the community, it's fine. But I learned, I was talking to someone recently who, maybe Portugal's the same way they're saying in France, I don't know if it's still like this, but in the past, they, re they required their police to basically live in like dormitories, like all in the same building. And I was like, well, that doesn't sound like something I would want in my country, but... Well, and it's interesting. I mean, yeah. I, I've, I've spent some time in France. And I mean, in Europe in general, the police are, in my opinion, a bit more militaristic, um, mm -hmm. not necessarily in appearance, but in, in culture, in the way that they interact with the public. There's not, it's not like officer friendly the right. same way. I mean, it, particularly in France, actually, uh, when I interacted with law enforcement in Italy and um, in other uh, Spain, um, pretty approachable, you know, I mean, but, but still, when you go up, I mean, it was like you didn't see like what you see here where kids go up and ask for stickers right, and stuff, right. like officer friendly stuff. You just didn't see that. Um, but it's interesting because the, should the cops live in the city conversation comes up a lot. I grew up in, in North Portland. Um, my dad was a police officer and he was an undercover drug cop. Mm -hmm. And so we had to move um, out of, out of the city because he was an undercover police officer. Yeah, and yeah. We would be going like to the grocery store and he'd see people. Totally. And that's he, the number one thing I hear right. is safety reasons. Um, and then for me, like, I mean, I, I got married in 2005 um, I moved, you know, back into this, into the area. Cause I was going to be a police officer here. I couldn't afford a house anywhere. Mm -hmm. We bought a house in Sandy. That was the, the only place at the time in the 2005, 2006 time, the houses were super expensive. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, so that was where I bought a house. And at that time, police officers didn't make very much at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, and then now it's like, <laughs> people talk so much about, well, we want our officers to be approachable. We want them to be comfortable. Well, when you interact every single day, it's like even driving down here, you know, driving to your show today, there are street corners. I used to work out here in this mm -hmm. district. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's hard to live and be comfortable, like raising your family and everything else. When because again, you don't go like good call to good call to good call. Yeah. It's difficult people or difficult moment in someone's life yeah. to diff and so yeah. it's really hard to just have that kind of soul rat resting moment yeah absolutely yeah. and then also go to work and be ready to be compassionate and everything else yeah. so people need respite um well and it's funny because i was literally just talking about this week people talk about this all the time not even in policing of like i need to get some distance from my work to like have a healthy life because yeah. it's just healthy you know you yeah. don't want to be in the same place where you're doing work all the yeah. time and i can imagine that's super you know to the extreme with police work yeah. because yeah i mean any suggestion i mean i was a district officer for 13 years and I would push back 
like to the death that that police officers aren't connected with the community they yeah. serve in, um, especially in the district police model. I mean, I again, I mean, you you sit in people's living rooms every day. Um, you get to know them. You get to know their kids. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just it, it is that that level of connection. Honestly, if you think about like your normal neighborhood, you don't even have that normally, other than the few people you know. Um, but that level of connection is unique. Yeah. Um, but it also requires a lot of mental fortitude. Well, and especially with, I think there a lot of them are gone now, but I've talked about a lot on the show, the school resource officers, like you mentioned in Portugal, like that to me is such an important connection to yeah. the community that maybe we lost or don't have. I was, I was actually the sergeant of our school resource division when it disbanded. Wow. Um, it was the worst decision the city has ever made. Um, and I mean, it's funny because, you know, you look at the time, uh, the schools asked us to leave and then the city acquiesced. That was what happened there. Um, I was sitting in the room when it took place. Wow. Um, and I've always kind of like the running joke is initially there was a rush to take credit and then now there's a rush to avoid blame. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, if you think about kids, especially kids who, I mean, school, my wife is a teacher. School is the safest place, or it should be, for many, many people. And so they know they're going to have a meal there. They mm-hmm. know there's structure in their day there. And when you are somebody where there's no structure at home, um, there's chaos at home, you're not safe at home, there's abuse at home, school is the only place you can go where you know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and we lost, I mean, through COVID and all of the disruption in schools, I mean, we lost so much connection mm-hmm. with kids and with community. Um, but even more so, if you think about kids who ha- have suspicions about law enforcement, don't trust law enforcement, um, you know, having school resource officers is a, is an, it, it, well, in by, in by design, it's a way for kids to connect with law enforcement in a non-threatening environment mm-hmm. um, where there's not crisis get to know them. So when they do have those crisis moments on the street, at home, wherever else, they're familiar with the process. They're familiar with who the people are. They know who to reach out to if something happens they don't like. Um, And so it's just critical. Um, And I will always feel that the cuts that were made in 2020 were incisive and intentional, and they were all surrounding relationship. Um, The people who desired to make those cuts were looking for places where we were successful, Mm -hmm. where they knew we had deep and abiding relationships and wanted to ruin them and take them out because by doing so you, you distance law enforcement from its community. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. I've, n- I've never thought about it that way, but it really does seem like that. You, it was like a targeted damaging of yeah. policing as a whole yeah. on purpose. Kind yeah. Of thing. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Um, let me back up a little bit. I wanted to ask you about like, tell me why you first got into policing and also like why you took up the union mantle role. Cause like I wrote down like, <laughs> Not all Portlanders, but some Portlanders love all unions except yours, it seems like. Yeah. <laughs> like. Which is interesting. I mean, it's a weird, like, double yeah. standard. But well, yeah. what's, what's funny with, with union rights in general, I mean, I'll, I'll answer your question in a second, but just to that point, what's funny, um, the things that management or kind of the government wants to, to do or navigate with its employees, unions try to abate, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you know, I mean, just the basics, you know, pay benefits and just kind of the rights of the working people. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is, is very often people will have different opinions about law enforcement and they'll be like, oh, well, the rules changing for them is okay. But the thing is, we're just, we're just the beginning. And you've seen this, I mean, arbitration rights changing, rules changing, pay and benefits changing. Even in Portland right now, there's a lot of conversations around health benefits for all of the, all of the unionized members. Mm. Um, and our contract is slightly different, but again, we're the way like people, the government or people who are trying to figure out ways to, to kind of get at workers' rights, they'll start by, well, you guys are comfortable with us changing the rights for law enforcement. Mm. See if it works, see if it holds in the courts and everything else, because the courts are, the laws and rules are all the same. And then if it does, they're coming for you. So you're the kind of guinea, um, guinea right, pig. For right. That, and yeah. so, and it's, I mean, and we saw in, in particular, the arbitration rights, um, our arbitration rights got changed, but those those were everyone's arbitration rights. Mm. And so it's funny because people think, well, it's okay to happen to you, but it won't happen to us, but it, it can and it will. Um, and when you say that, you mean like any public union? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so it's just, it is perplexing in my world where people are like, it's okay if you guys get mm-hmm. kind of attacked because um, it won't happen to me. And then it happens to them. And years later, they're like, gosh, we probably shouldn't have. <laughs> You know, but it's just, it is, that's kind of frustrating. But yeah. anyway, but um, so as to why, so my dad, as I mentioned, my dad was a police officer in Portland. Uh, he got hired four months after I was born. Um, 
And so this is all I've ever known. Um, I grew up with my dad uh, being my hero. Um, and and I, I, you know, if I got in trouble at home, my mom would call the watch sergeant. And my dad would come home in his police car and throw me in the back and I get in trouble. Um, but I, I mean, I just grew up in the police world and I grew up in, in, in the police culture. I, I remember, you know, my dad would break his ankle or something at work and, you know, you'd have cops coming and reciting our house. And it's just, it was just like a kind of familial mm-hmm. reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as I got older, um, you know, there was this big debate and what do I want to do? I talked about doing other jobs. Um, but really kind of the, the moment for me, um, when, when Colleen Weibel was killed, um, in 1998, I think was the year, um, I was in high school. Um, that was my dad's, uh, uh warrant he had written. Mm. Um, and when, um, when that shooting took place, I was at school and we heard, and I heard who had gotten shot. Um, and the, uh, and Kim Keast, uh, was my dad's partner and she had gotten shot and, uh, Jim Hudson, uh, had gotten shot as well. Um, that was just a, a real kind of sentinel moment in my life of just, um, this work matters. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, it was, I mean, it just was a big moment in my life. And so that kind of cemented for me, um, you know, we, we need people who are willing to step into that role. Um, there are bad people in the world, but there's also people who need help. Um, my dad, um, in like 1996 or so, the Willamette Week wrote, he was 98, maybe wrote a, a, an article about him. Um, he and his partner saying that defense attorneys were upset because he was too nice to their clients mm. and that they felt like it was kind of a grift where like that he'd become friends with them. And so I just, you know, watching my dad, watching the way he did the work, I was like, man, I can do that. I can, I can engage with people in a different way. Um, and so that was kind of the start, mm. um, very early on in my career. I got hired when I was 22. Um, I don't know if you've met any 22 year old men. Yeah. Um, it's pretty young. Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it, you know, it was, I mean, it, I, I, I had all the, the ability and none of the brains. Mm. Um, and I'm just, you know, it's my own <laughs> observation of myself. And it was, I mean, the, I remember the very first call I went on was a domestic violence call. Wow. And I walked into the house, I was trained, I was ready. And the people had been married for like 35 years and had been fighting for 32 of them. Right. I mean, Jeez. and so, and I remember them looking at me and I'm just this stupid kid who has no idea. Um, how to navigate the world here trying to give these people marital advice. It didn't go very well. Um, but anyway, so for me, like early on, I realized the gap and how much I needed to learn. Um, and then several years in, I started seeing people kind of doing things in and around law enforcement, um, Portland being what it was that was frustrating. So I started getting involved in our union um, as a rep um, about four years after I got hired. Um, okay, yeah. And so I've been involved with the PPA as a rep on the board for since 2009. Um, but uh, 2020, I think for all of us, was just a, a huge emotional hit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I've spoken on a lot of these shows, you know, watching fences rise around our police station. There was just a lot of moments where you're like, man, what, what, where do we go from here? Right. Um, there was a lot of change in the union for a couple of years there. Um, you know, we, uh, we had a long-term president who, uh, did a great job. He retired. Um, then we had another change. And so there was just this moment where you know, I told my wife, I was like, I, for whatever reason, um, this is all lined up where there's a, there's this vacancy. I have been involved with this for a long time and we need someone much like when I wanted to be a police officer who understands what it's going to take. Um, is willing to spend 10 to 12 years because we need stability. Mm -hmm. Um, But we just need somebody to just jump into this thing. Mm -hmm. And I I had the ability to do that. So uh, my members elected me. Um, I'm honored to represent them every day. Um, This is the hardest job I've ever done. Um, But it is uh, the PPA exists in a strange place in our ecosystem in Portland here. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we, we hope to just kind of help pull back the curtain for people so they can see what's going on in law enforcement. Um, Police unions don't exist to protect bad cops. Mm -hmm. Um, What we exist to do is ensure that whenever anything happens, the truth is told that, that, that due process is found and people have access not only to navigating the outcome, because again, something can happen that isn't unlawful, but impacts the community. We want to make sure that they have that access, but also um, that we have people who are willing to do this job because they know they have their rights protected. Right, right. Um, yeah. And it, it is, it's critical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny when you were talking, that's a really cool story. Um, 
when you were talking about that, you jogged my memory. Do you remember that guy, Z-Man? I think that was his yeah. name. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, forgot about that until just now, but he, I believe he died like a while back, right? He was, died. Uh, but that was a cool community kind of connection. Yeah, right? so I, it was, it was. I want to say, just about 10 years after uh, uh, Colleen did. I mean, mm-hmm. it's on the same day, if I remember correctly. Wow, is that right? Um, yeah. uh, and it was in, it's in January. I, off the top of my head, I want to say it's January like 28th or so. Um, but they both... Um, if, if I remember correctly, they both died in the same day. He died in a very tragic uh, car accident up mm-hmm. in Washington. Um, everyone knew him. I mean, I, I mean, and that's the yeah. thing is that it just seems like that kind of connection was so yeah. much stronger at some point. Or I don't know. Yeah. Well, and again, and it's like like back then, um, because because that kind of community connection was so revered, and this is where it's very frustrating. Like people have interesting historical memories of. I mean, and there have been events in Portland that have been challenging, but. I mean, there are so many police officers who have been just amazing human beings that have worked in Portland. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he is one. And I mean, coming up, uh, Jan Ellertson, who was one of my uh, academy like leaders, she was really close with him. And it's all, I mean, all the time, all we heard was, was stories about, about Z-Man and a bunch of others just, you know, and again, people who showed up to my house when I was a kid. I mean, and just, I grew up revering them and understanding how important that community connection was. I mean, Harry Jackson was one of my dad's sergeants. I mean, there's just so many of these connections. Um, and it's important. It's so funny because like people, they wish we had that now. Um, and the only reason I think that we, I mean, we do to a degree, but the reason we don't have the, the big named individuals is because we've been so separated from our community. And we also, given our staffing reality, I mean, we have more police officers then than we do now. And De- we definitely. have twice as many people that live in Portland. Yeah. Um, and so the, the amount of time it took, you know, to, to build those relationships and have the time to go and just stand on a street corner and talk to people. Right. It's just not, um, not there. No. And I mean, I, and, 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 well, and, and, and a lot of people in our society are saying that, you know, we don't want to see police cars. I mean, I think probably the most bizarre thing I read when our school police were being disbanded is, is, uh, you know, David Douglas, they literally were like, we don't want to see police cars from our school campuses. Like it's something um, evil or bad. Right. Yeah. And, and it's just like, I mean, and, and what was so tragic about that is David Douglas had the, I mean, their school police officer had been there for 20 something years. Mm. Um, he was just so deeply connected to that community. Um, and I, I mean, I watched his heartbreak. I mean, just because it was, he, you know, he was, he had spent so much of his adult life being connected to that community right, just building that and it wasn't taken by the community it was taken by politicians yeah um and that was hard yeah when it's yeah it's just i was talking about this a little bit on the other episode I did, but i found I, I didn't even know that a lot of schools now have like private security there yeah which just seems like so many kids and parents are worried about school safety and that just seems like such a worse option to me than a school resource officer but well, so the CSOs, at least, and I know, I don't know the ones in some of the other smaller districts, but the ones that Portland has are remarkable human beings. And I want to be clear on that. They do an amazing job. We work directly with them. And really the thing that's so challenging about role setting. So I also ran our bar detail for a while and we worked a lot with security, you know, in the bars and everything else. Mm-hmm. Everyone's got a role. Um, and from an accountability standard, I mean, it, it's funny because, you know, the Portland Police Bureau has a insanely robust accountability system, mm-hmm. um, and there's laws and rules and everything right. else that dictate what law enforcement can do. They're very, they're different for private security or or, or non sworn individuals. Um, and I heard often from a lot of these folks that were working in security in the schools that they didn't want mission drift, right? I mean, they wanted to have the relationships. And again, if you're not a police officer, you can build a relationship maybe differently with individuals who are mm-hmm. kind of reticent to have relationships with law enforcement. So it's critical. Um, and um, I just, I worked with them all the time and I just, I cannot say enough good things about the work they do. It's just a different job. Wow. Yeah. Well, I never thought um, about it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so that part is just kind of like, you know, like a firefighter's asked to do something that's not putting out a fire, there might be some, uh, you know, skill drift there. But um, I, I just, at the end of the day, um, if you want to prevent a fight or you want to prevent, you know, something, you know, some kind of you know interpersonal issue or whatever else, the, the CSOs have deep and abiding relationships with the students and they do a great job. Um, but there were many, many times when we were doing our work where, I mean, you have guns in schools, you have things that are yeah, going on yeah, yeah. and using the relationship, our, the CSOs were able to kind of, you know, triangulate and separate kids and the police could come in in a very nondescript way and come in and navigate that situation often where nobody even knew we were there. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, 
You don't want roll drift. You don't want unarmed people going and trying to find somebody with a gun and try to deal with that situation because yeah. it's not safe. It's too much to ask of them. That's what I was going to Those are unarmed. Usually. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, but, um, but again, when we had that relationship, um, again, I, I mean, I'm not going to get into too many details, but we, we would have situations, you know, in Portland where you had, you know, a, a student or some kind of dangerous situation where we could call into the school, talk to the principal, CSOs, again, would, would lock down certain areas of the school where there, you know, so that there was no students having access to that area. Police could come in, you know, not lights and sirens, not creating a big right. deal, come in and go and navigate that individual and get them out. And nobody even knew we were there. Yeah. What a different relationship that is. Because now if you call law enforcement, nobody knows. Nobody, No one knows who to call. Um, we do have a couple of liaison officers. We had one. We have two now. So that's good. Um, but it's just at the end of the day, uh, emotional safety in a school environment. And really, honestly, you're seeing it manifest itself in, in just everywhere now. Mm -hmm. You know, your neighbor has uh, their house broken into or whatever else. That emotional safety, that that is, you know, it, it's an economy. It is, it's cost. And if you lose it, building it back, it's different for each person. Um, and it's really difficult. Um, and parents need to feel comfortable sending their kids to school. Um, it's the, yeah, it, totally. Yeah. It's the biggest commitment we make as parents, um, mm -hmm. as far as just blindly hoping yeah. <laughs> that our kids are safe, you know? Um, and I think that's why these events that happen nationwide have caused, caused such tension. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. That's what I meant to you. Yeah. When I said, that's all I hear about is people worried about the school shootings and stuff, but, um, let me move on to, I wanted to talk about if you want to, this new crowd response team for this next year. Because mm -hmm. I've been saying, not every single episode, but almost everyone, I'm like, there's going to be big riots this year in 2024. And um, and just with my own, like, I used to work for two TV stations here, and, you know, carrying a camera, I was assaulted by a lot of these extreme Antifa people a lot of the time just because you're part of the press. Like, right. And I'd ask them, like, you don't want a free press out here, and they don't want it. But anyway, I'm just curious, like, can you, like, lay out what this new team does the differences that, that they that sure um you know it's funny um i want to level set a little bit and it's it's um so i don't know why i didn't expect there to be so much attention to this thing um yeah. because it's something that i think i mean i talk to people every day politicians uh you know portlanders citizens all over the i mean i talked all i do is talk i've not t spoken to a single person not a single one other than the select few um same people who say the same things over and over and over again um, people expect and want there to be order. Um, but from a level setting standpoint, it's been really, really frustrating. A lot of the news coverage has been like, oh, the community distrusts this or they're nervous about this or whatever else. We we need to be honest and not gaslight Portlanders about what happened in 2020. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking um, it's, it's like... Because to me, you got to change something post right. 2020. Right. We don't want another sure. year. Of... Right, right. But so, and, and again... To me, when you look at the kind of causal relationship around law enforcement and what happened in 2020, um, we had a very well-trained rapid response team that, A, the actual origins of RRT was earthquake response. They just had this really? added. Yes, they were, they, were, they were an all hazards team. They were there to deal with hazmat situations, earthquakes, all the things. Okay, yeah. And then they also did this work because they were the only team we had that was yeah. set up to. And I know in a lot of protests, it's kind of an all hands, like yeah. overtime situation yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, but so we were ready for a normal, you know, we had, you know, Occupy and post Ferguson, there were right. some deals. I mean, we had dealt with some, you know, it used to be, you know, like, like post uh, like 2003, uh, you know, uh, the Iraq war, there was some big, yeah, you know, yeah. so we had dealt well, with stuff. Yeah. Portland had a regular current. Sure. Of, yeah. What happened in 2020 and then also the sustained level. So I, I've been talking a lot about this, but I mean, LA had five days, yeah. <laughs> five days. We had 180. Um, and someone told me, and I don't know if it's, if it's true, but it's interesting. Uh, I was told that uh, LA reported 12,000 uses of force mm. in five days. We had 6,500 in 180. When, when people say that the Portland police were brutal, Honestly, the, of course, we could have done things better in some cases. But again, let's be honest about what happened. On the very first day, it was May 29th, I believe, a group of people, I mean, and RRT was ready. Everyone was there. A group of people marched down. And I've spoken with many, many police officers who were there that night. I was there the next day. But something was different. Mm -hmm. A group of people broke into an occupied jail and lit it on fire. There's no way to evacuate those people. And if that building was not just made of a bunch of cement, 
What do right? And, and and the government has a moral responsibility to each and every one of those inmates. And then that night, you start seeing in Seattle and Minneapolis police stations burning to the ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fences within a day go up and surround blocks in downtown Portland. I've lived in Portland my whole life. That's never happened before. Yeah. And then within a few weeks, the rules start changing. We can't use certain tools. We, mm -hmm. we have a judge say we can't videotape what's happening, which is in just patently insane because the yeah, only videos yeah. we had were videos that were controlled by anarchists by people it's, it's it, ridiculous to me too if somebody worked for the press because like if you're on public property anybody can film anything right like it doesn't... but so but but we couldn't right uh, and it's all and, and, and so for a couple nights we had our our forensic team out there with cameras just all they were doing was filming what was happening you know we don't edit it everything right. we do but but so we couldn't do that anymore um you know we couldn't again uh all the the information and, and frustration around tear gas the big problem was i mean i was down there for 30 days people were throwing explosives they were throwing yeah. molotov cocktails they were shooting uh, ball bearings throwing frozen water bottles all these things at police officers we had, we had a multitude of officers get significantly injured mm -hmm. um and if we didn't engage they would seek us out i mean i was in central precinct and in north precinct and in my union hall in which all three of those structures were surrounded and, and boarded shut in attempt to be burned. Yeah, I was going to um, mention, I remember North yeah, as well yeah. for weeks was also they, they tried to burn I, it down. I mean, they literally, they literally boarded the doors of North Precinct shut with people inside and tried wow. to light it on fire. Jeez. So, so again, it is so frustrating to me when people, and, you know, and we talk about lawsuits and I commend Commissioner Gonzalez you know, one of these guys comes in and says, well, we had $2 million in settlements. We can spend an hour talking about the litigious nature of our city and how settlements work. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the city has to make a very cynical decision around the cost and the attorney's fees for fighting. Because if you, if you lose a lawsuit, you have to pay both. And we also have an insurance company who decides whether or not we settle cases. Mm -hmm. um, this if it, is if it's worth it. Right. right. Yeah. These are all administrative financial decisions. They're not moral decisions. Mm -hmm. And but again, you look at Portland had 180 days and two and a half million dollars in settlements or whatever it is. Denver had 14 million. Yeah. You know, Austin had 15 million. So and they had not even a, the beginning of what we had. So for me, it's just it's very, very frustrating um, because I feel like we can't allow history to be twisted into something that it wasn't. Um, so the big difference now from my perspective, in 2020 or well, 2021, that legislative session, a bunch of laws changed. And then very quickly, they kind of got tweaked again because we basically all kinetic projectiles were taken away. And the difficulty is, is if we can't like reach out and touch people and say, please stop doing this, go away. The only option we have are sticks, um, right, and top, yeah, and it yeah. looks awful. Right, right. Um, people have a very emotional response to police officers hitting people with batons. Yeah, um, but it's the only option we have mm -hmm. if you don't allow us to do things that are area control. Um, and so, you know, it is challenging. Um, those laws have shifted enough now. Um, and now my hope is that that the next, you know, the first conversation is is just compensation and getting people who want to do the work. The next conversation has to be, what is the work? Mm -hmm. Specifically, how do you want to engage? What are the rules? What are the laws? Have all those conversations now with the judges. What can we do? What can't we do? You know, we have body cameras now. And honestly, it's kind of funny. We have body cameras, but we couldn't videotape with cameras behind us can we with body cameras like how do we navigate all that yeah um i mean it does seem like a good idea yeah to get that all squared away before right this right season or right. whatever you know so my hope is that we will navigate all that and and again my my greatest hope is that we don't have what we had in 2020 and again so again culturally if you start looking at acquiescence um there was a lot of weirdness nationwide and you know some of the you had national news organizations saying well rioting is a form of protest right. peaceful protests, mostly peaceful protests yeah. you know the mostly peaceful fires i mean it's just it was we've all seen that yeah the cnn yeah guy with the flames behind him i mean just i mean really strange and so um you know what's so interesting is is the group there's just we have a very violent group of people in portland who will co-opt anything because mm -hmm. it's incredible every time there's any kind of emotion or energy behind yeah. any movement they're behind it and I, i'm like a news junkie but they follow the news like more than i do right they'll look for an opportunity and just any group 
that will show up anywhere, they're behind that thing. I mean, they, they, you know, you had people showing up when, when we had a city of Portland uh, union striking, mm -hmm. you had members of this group showing up to support their strike. It's like, well, okay, that that's where we're at now. But again, the whole point is they're not looking for ideology. They're looking for energy. Mm -hmm. And so in 2020, you had COVID was still kind of going. People couldn't get out, but the government supported people gathering in the right. streets. You could still go. You had, again, you had uh, a very volatile election nationwide. You had a very, uh, you know, critical incident in the George Floyd uh, incident. And so as a result, you had a lot of people who wanted to speak and for a sustained period of time. And so that group had cover for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we hadn't seen that level of sustain for a long time because usually most people are kind of like, okay, I'm, I, I've said my piece, right. um, but Get it kind of was, system. right. But it's the only thing you could do. Um, and so, you know, my, my, my hope for, for most, I mean, the vast majority of Portlanders who value free speech, that they understand that their ability to speak freely is actually being taken by people who co-opt their movement. Mm -hmm. um, if you see people engaging in overt violence, who if, if people come out and say, hey, this is the date and time, this is a direct action event, where, right. you know, be fluid, be right. water, whatever, and then they go and they're, they're specifically telling people to engage in violence, don't go there. Mm -hmm. Don't allow them to take your moment. Um, because it's every single day in 2020, there were revolution hall events every single day and the police weren't there ever and nothing happened damian lillard marched across the burnside bridge with twenty thousand people yeah. nothing happened yeah that's it it was only when these people mm -hmm. would find the energy and the crowd would allow them to take their energy would these things happen yeah yeah it's, it's the common and maybe it wasn't always at night but yeah you see a lot of those like more peaceful things in the day and yeah. then every single night it would kind of curdle into this extremist kind yeah. of thing and but yeah, I mean, yeah, it does seem like a good idea to get the, I don't know, at least to me to get this team together before this election season. At yeah. Least. Um, okay. Um, you kind of got into this a little bit, but I was just curious, like, what do you, because I've had people on the show that say no public union should exist. And then specifically police unions are a problem, but I don't agree with that. I'm just curious what you think, like, what would you say to people that. Well, a legally, people can organize. I mean, that's just, it's just a th that that's what freedom I mean, Americans can do. Um, what's funny though is, I mean, you know, most police officers aren't like super big, like hoorah union people, um, but they are very devoted to their craft and to their work and need and want the protections that exist. Um, we just worked on and passed a bill in Salem to allow sergeants and supervisors to organize in this state, hmm. and the reason that we did that is again, like. If you think about why you need a union, I mean, A, paying benefits, right? I mean, that matters. Mm -hmm. um, and why does that matter to Portlanders? Well, if you look in the places that have more issues with law enforcement, or, or they're usually in states where there are no collective bargaining rights. They're in states where their officers don't get paid very well. They don't get trained very well. They're not very well equipped. And especially now on staffing levels are so right. bad, you know. And so the reason that paying benefits matter for law enforcement is if you want doctorate level policing, you got to pay. You got to pay yeah. them not to be doctors, right? I mean, you got to put, create an environment, a work environment where people will actually be willing to do the job. Yeah. Um, and unions are vital for that. Um, I mean, you look at the disparities. Uh, uh, one, of, one of the sergeants that came and testified on our bill, Umatilla County Sergeant in the jails, they, their sergeants weren't getting paid overtime. Wow. Because they weren't unionized. And so they would have a riot and they get called in, but they wouldn't get paid overtime for it. You're going to get good supervisors? Yeah. Or are you going to get worse supervisors in that situation? Yeah. And again, supervision, we know, is the biggest key to accountability. So you want to make sure you have your best and your brightest wanting to promote. Um, and this isn't criticizing the current sergeants. I just think that you're you're creating a cynical whatever. Um, but also, you know, you look at the legal defense structure. I mean, due process is a bedrock of our society. Um, and having you know, access to lawyers, access to good systems and process. It, it is absolutely critical to accountability that we have systems that are repeatable, that are consistent, that don't make political decisions, but instead make decisions based on the facts on the ground, based mm -hmm. on just cause. That's the legal standard in our country. That's the legal standard in our state. Um, and if done correctly, anyone who wants access to law enforcement, there's no better pathway than through the 
union because I can talk about anything. Yeah. I can sit and, and have coffee and, and walk through any kind of critical whatever um, differently than somebody who's an elected or different than somebody who, you know, is kind of stuck within the bureaucracy. Um, but at the end of the day, the right to bargain, the right to gather, the right to have a union is it's embedded in our constitution in this state. Um, and it's vital. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. Cause I've just, I think people like pick and choose. Like, <laughs> I don't want to say I'm anti teachers union, but the whole pe- uh, teachers union thing this past year, I was just like disgusted with. And, but it's just like, I see the, I see the need for a union in both situations, yeah. you know? Uh, well, and, and so, and also, I mean, one thing that's interesting about the PPA that I think uh, sets us apart and is important um, the political action that the PPA engages in is not a mandatory participate for our members. Mm-hmm. Um, we we do engage in political activity, but we do it only with the me- the money that our members who wish to engage in that conversation provide. I think that that's critical. Mm-hmm. Um, we also try not to. Um, so you're saying they they kind of volunteer that money. Yeah. Okay. So when you sign up for the PPA, you can choose whether or not to engage in our pack. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and I think that it means like a it, good. Tr- yeah, yeah, it yeah. seems like a small thing, but you talk to many people who have joined our, our organization, new hires who have been in other unions. Mm-hmm. They're like, you know, the biggest reason I don't want to be in a union is I feel like my union supports candidates or causes that right. I don't support. Right. It's like, well, good for you. We don't require that you participate yeah, in that. Yeah. So your money won't go to that. Your money really is only going to your legal defense and for me um, and to pay for our office so that we can advocate for you. Yeah. Um, but we also can't strike. Um, so uh, there's, right. That's yeah. Uh, I That's mean, the one thing the teachers thing really kind of. I was like, this is illegal in most of the country, and yeah. But anyway, I don't. I mean, and again, I, I don't want to criticize or critique someone else's condition I, I, or situation. I don't I don't know anything about what yeah. they're what, what they were facing. And again, my wife is a teacher. Um, the teachers in this country don't get paid enough. They don't get supported enough. Um, it is um, it's amazing. You know, people you hear the level of criticism. People will talk about teachers. Oh, they only got work, you know, three quarters of the year or whatever. Uh, my wife during the school year works nine days a week. Like, I, I, mean, the, I mean, there's not that many days, but you know what I mean? I mean yeah, she, yeah. She's constantly working. She's getting emails from parents all the time it never ends and it is i mean you couldn't pay them enough um and you know but obviously you got to navigate the budget that exists so i just you know same thing with with school structures and there's a where i live there's a a bond measure and you know people are very cynical about should we support or should we not i just the, the the biggest responsibility we have as adults is providing for safe environments for kids that are functional and giving them a good education i i just so that part of it, I'm all I'm all in for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, uh, I was going to ask you because I didn't even know this was a thing, but there's like a low percentage of people who don't join the union, or is it even an option? Uh, so after the Janus ruling, uh, you uh, you don't you you basically you can opt out. You can opt out. Okay. Um, we we have been at very 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 nearly 100 percent for the yeah. entire existence of our organization. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. Um, I didn't know that until like a couple weeks ago. But um, we've had like um, one hand number of people yeah. <laughs> in the history of our our organization not right. join. And the biggest, I'm honestly, the biggest reason is you pay into our union and you have legal defense. And so if you get involved in something, you get a lawyer for free. Yeah, that's it's seems just, pretty it's like just a insurance. good option. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. car insurance at that point. Um, I wanted to ask you about a couple things. Working with the new city council, I know like you wouldn't directly kind of work with them, but um. Just what do you think of the new city council that we're going to have? And like, do you think that's more difficult in the future for like what you do? Or? Um, well, we, I and we did not support the charter change. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that's always been frustrating for me with Portland is that it's like, certainly the commission style form of government is problematic. Um, you know, you have people who don't have expertise in certain fields being the director of a bureau. Right. Um, and I do feel like the setup of our current form of government leads to kind of political activism by using, you know, like PBOT to engage in something against some other group you don't. I mean, it's just, there's just, it's, it doesn't function very well yeah, yeah. or at all. Um, the current council I really like. I mean, they're all, they're all very approachable and, and whatever, but I just think the system, having a city manager to me makes sense. But of course, uh, Portland 
has this tendency to go with the like nuclear option. Right. Like, and so, I mean, I've spoken with people in Europe who've like, even we have never heard of this, the, the, the style of ranked choice voting mm -hmm. we're doing. I think the odds of us getting uh, very confusing results are very high. And then if you get someone who's problematic, trying to get them out is going to be very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, for that, but I mean, there's very good people running. Um, you know, I've spoken with a lot of them. Uh, I, I think the one good thing, the, the, the city council should be far more representative. Um, you know, I, I, my heart is always in East, has always been in East Portland. I worked in East Portland for a long time and everyone knows the moment you get into the numbers, there's just nothing for, of support from the government. Mm -hmm. Um, it's food desert, it's an opportunity desert, it's kind of like an everything desert. Right. Um, yeah. But there's wonderful people who live out there. Uh, many people who live out there as a result of being kind of forced out there. And so um, that part of it, I think, is is good. Um, having representatives from each area. Um, I think there are candidates who are running in some of these areas because they have to because they live there, but not because they care about those areas. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that Portlanders pay very good attention. Um, people aren't hiding the ball. Uh, the rhetoric is very clear. And it's also very clear that based on polling and just kind of common sense, navigating our drug crisis or homelessness crisis or mental health crisis, you know, public safety issues writ large. Those are the things that Portlanders care about yeah. restoring our city. And when you have people who are openly saying they don't want to do those things, we probably shouldn't elect those people. Yeah. Um, I would agree with that for um, sure. <laughs> but, but yeah, it'll be, it, it will be interesting. Um, at the end of the day, um, it's not my job to decide what government structure it is. I didn't, you know, I said I wasn't a fan, but um, yeah, no, it's just interesting because, yeah, you, you spent so much time growing up here and stuff. And yeah, yeah I, I mean, I would not have voted for it. Um, yeah, but I will work uh, in the environment that is created. And, um, you know, instead of having to try to build relationships with five people, I'll get to build relationships with 13 people. Right. Um, or maybe eight. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I meant. It's like, it's that it just seems yeah. more difficult. But yeah. I mean, the whole transition is going to be tough. And you know, yeah, time I mean, consuming and We'll see. We're all in it together. We'll see. Uh... Yeah. I mean, what I mean, and that's the thing is, is there's just so much change coming all at once. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I, I, it's hard to know really what this will look like. And I don't think anyone really knows, um, but we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. <laughs> um, okay. I wanted to also ask you about Portland street response. Mm -hmm. Like I just, I, I honestly don't know as much as I should about it, but I just feel like a lot of these new candidates that we were talking about, they kind of just point to them as a solution for a lot sure. of the livability problems we have. And I, my reaction is just like, I don't think they're equipped to deal with a lot of those issues. Some, yeah. some of them maybe, but. Well, what's really interesting for me is when, I mean, street response has become this kind of like it's ours, right? And so people, I mean, it, it comes up in almost every conversation as like. A silver bullet. Or yeah. Something. And what's important for me is so. As a police officer, we've been offered as solutions to things that we're not solutions to. And it's frustrating. And if I were a PSR employee, I would be frustrated because the same thing is happening. Mm. Whenever people say, but PSR about something, but oh, but they could do this. It just I think the important thing is just to ask how, mm -hmm. what's their role? Because again, role assignment is the most important thing. And again, what also matters is the origin story. At its origin, PSR was created as a replacement to law enforcement. Hmm. The idea by the commissioner that proposed them was we wanted we want unarmed people coming to calls involving people in crisis so that we can that, because it will lead to better outcomes. Now, I just I do not disagree at all that police officers need more resources to navigate certain calls, and I also don't disagree that we are not equipped to navigate like chronic long term navigation of hmm. mental health issues and addiction issues. But for the same reason that we needed to navigate Measure 110 in a certain way is we have more touch points with people who are suffering from addiction and mental health than anyone else because th that manifests itself and bubbles out all the time. Now, so PSR is created to, again, as a first responder. What do first responders do? They abate acute crises in our streets. That's our job. Mm -hmm. You put out a fire. You respond to a, an acute medical issue and get them to long-term care. Police officers show up because there's some kind of acute problem on the street. We don't prosecute the cases. All we do is abate it, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's what first responders do. PSR was created as a, a member of the first responder family. What can they abate? I mean, I, I, the only thing I would say is like addiction, but it's just... But so let's 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 talk. About I, I don't even think they do because there's nowhere to put them. Or this is the that. problem, right? Yeah. So so so, and this is and this is not a criticism of them. Yeah, 
I think they should be manifested far more robustly. One of the ballot measures we introduced creates that connection. And, and the reason for it is, is they're not a first responder and that's not an insult. They're not set up to be one. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want them to be one, what would they need? They would need to be able to transport people and they would need to be a mobile service provider instead of a mobile service suggester. Mm. Right now they show up and they have no ability to take custody of people, no ability to move people, no ability to even get people to treatment. Mm -hmm. Even if, even if you get the perfect scenario and the person says, I would like to go to treatment right now. They can't transport people. There's nowhere. First of all, yeah, they can't transport them and may, there may be nowhere to even right. put the right. person. So, I mean, the second issue is a whole, <laughs> Right. <laughs> I yeah. mean, we need to figure that out too. But so the, from, from my perspective, um, again, the origin story was broken. You look at the CAHOOTS model, people suggest that CAHOOTS was built in partnership with law enforcement. Mm. Law enforcement was at the table because in Eugene, the government agreed and understood that law enforcement was not the proper resource for long-term ongoing care. Mm -hmm. And PSR agrees when I've spoken with them that they're a triage model, not a acute model. And that's okay, right? That's okay, but it's different. So they're not a first responder. Um, and when we suggest that they are, it dilutes and creates other problems. But the biggest frustration I think that most Portlanders have when they've actually called, when, when, when someone calls 911 and asks for PSR, that individual, right, might is one caller, but usually you get three or four calls about something. And each one of those three or four people want something different. Some people want the person moved along. Some people want the person arrested. Some people want the person taken mm -hmm. to treatment or this or that or whatever else. Some people just want the person left alone, but they just want someone to check on them. Each one of those Portlanders is paying taxes for that service and has an expectation that the government change the situation. And so if you don't do something to help that solution be brought to fruition, they're going to keep calling yeah, and keep calling. And then eventually the police show up and everyone knows based on studies and, and data that the more times you interact with somebody who's in crisis, the more likely that person is to really ramp up. Mm -hmm. And if the police are there, the fourth or the fifth time they've been bothered that day and that person freaks out and we end up having some kind of physical interaction, the critique is not what happened in all these other times and why did we not fix it then? It's why did the police do that? Mm -hmm. And that's why it's kind of unfair for one. And for two, it is a reason why we need partnership. There needs to be a co-response model. There needs to be the ability for PSR to be a more woven piece of our response. But again, in the ballot measure that we introduced, you have the ACLU saying, well, we don't want PSR working with law enforcement, mm. which is funny because... PSR and the PPA have an agreement that was agreed to by the city to partner. Mm. Um, and so this is, again, where societal accord, talked about it with Portugal. Are we going to do everything we can to make sure we get people help, the best help as soon as possible and weave our approach? Or are we going to silo each other out because right. we have a specific animus towards law enforcement leading to worse outcomes? Yeah, it's totally true. Yeah, it's um, I've mentioned it on one of the last episodes I did, but I'm going to, I'm doing this episode on uh, Multnomah County Corrections soon. Mm -hmm. And I've just become a totally convinced believer in this model of using these unused space in the jails that used to be used for treatment to do that. Seem to work and pretty well in Bybee Lakes. Yeah. And, and exactly. And people just, I think like you just mentioned are so anti law enforcement that they just say, well, that's going to never work. Like this yeah. is such a bad idea, but it makes total sense to me. I don't know why we're not doing yeah. it. Like, I don't... And it's interesting too, like I, I, I have built a lot of relationships with, with, I mean, just kind of peculiar partnerships, with people who historically don't like law enforcement very much, um, just in the different touch points I've had in the last couple of years. Um, and I was talking to one of them and he's like, man, how do we, like a lot of the people who work in the treatment world don't like law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, why? Well, they think, you know, they, they over arrest people or whatever else. And I'm like, so I get that. And I can't fix that. But what if, what if we find all of those people and say, you kind of have two options here. You can keep saying, I don't like law enforcement, but have a limited ability to engage in taking some of the work that law enforcement does. Or even if you don't like the cops, why not just say, look, I'm the bulwark against the predations of law enforcement. I know what it's like to be dealing with a drug issue mm -hmm. or addiction issue. Mm -hmm. I got sober. I know now that for me, jail didn't work, but for some people it did. 
But no matter what, I'm going to be a resource to someone suffering from addiction. I'm going to have access to law enforcement so that I can ensure that law enforcement doesn't do the things I don't want them to do by being there early mm -hmm. and taking some of that work back and bringing people to different places. And you could even say to your clients, look, you don't want to interact with law enforcement. I'm your quickest way away from that. So if you get in trouble or you're with the cops, they can call me. I will show up right now and I'll get you out of that situation. I'll take you to treatment. Mm -hmm. There's just that hesitation because they don't even want to be around. Right. But again, there's lots of things that I don't like. I don't like going to the dentist, <laughs> yeah. right? I have to but, go this week. Right. Yeah, the um, but again, the point is, is that again, if, if, even if you don't like the environment, you don't like the individual people, because again, it seems very personal, figure out how to be a part of the solution. Right, right. Um, but it's just, I mean, again, at the end of the day, law enforcement has more necessary touch points with people suffering from mental health and addiction than any other group in the world. It's just a statement of fact. Yeah. And so if you want to prevent law enforcement from having to over police and do other things or whatever else, be a part of the solution. Be willing Come to, to the table. Yeah. I, we had a meeting the other day with uh, three addiction specialists, people who used to be users, you have been arrested. They've gone to jail for addiction. Um, I invited them to, the, to, the, to East Precinct the other day to come in and talk to some of our police officers. And I will tell you, the coolest thing about, about that meeting and the reason I wanted to have it at a police station, because initially like, oh, well, where, where, where can we meet? When they walk into that police station, they're coming through the front door. They're, they're, they're experiencing their sobriety, mm -hmm. right? They're coming into a building where historically, if they got into trouble, they were right. coming in the back door right. through a sally port. But now they're sober. They're just totally committed to helping other people. They're coming through the front door. They're walking back to our roll call room where we have our meetings and they're sitting down with police officers and having a one-on-one -on -one conversation where there is no power dynamic. They're at the table as an equal member. Mm -hmm. And what better way to buoy the souls of people who have gotten sober, who have gotten clean, who are now a part of the solution to remind them that they're not below anybody. They are right in the same level with all the people that people view as authority, mm -hmm. their authorities in addiction recovery, right? We need them. And to me, that and just watching their faces, it was awesome because they you could see that they felt right. equal and embraced and instead right. seeing this place in a different light. Right. And, and so um that's where we need to be in my from my perspective. We need to be in a place where um again, a, it's a multidisciplinary approach to solving our community's problems. That's what we did in the schools. I would go and sit with the parents and the teachers and the, you know, all the different specialists and everything, and we would make a plan for an individual kiddo on how to get them help. That's the kind of triage we should be doing. We should be having, you know, like just fully robust information about individuals, who their parents are and everything else. So when they get into crisis, we know how to help them as an individual. And the only way we do that is by combining our resources. Mm -hmm. Cooperating and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, we're almost done. I just have a couple more. I have a couple more like serious questions and I have a bunch sure. of goofy questions, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I wanted to like, tell me a little bit about recruiting right now in this kind of modern policing area. I asked Eli Arnold about that and he gave me some good stuff, but I'm just curious, like, cause obviously staffing levels are yeah crazy low. I mean, I don't know, at least to me, they seem crazy low, but tell me about like how that's going. And, um, well, two things are important again to levels. Well, a to level set, we knew we were going to have a staffing issue in like 2012. It's um, long, it, long time. Um, ago, yeah. In the, in the nineties, we had huge hiring classes because they, did a big hiring push to get more police officers. When you hire a bunch of people at the same time, you create the right. reality that all of those people drop will, will, will become retirement eligible at the same time. Yeah. In about 2012, 2015, 2018, there were a couple of times where we had hiring freezes. You cannot do that in public safety because it takes 18 months to get someone fully up. You have to over hire in the anticipation of dips from, right, from right. retirement. So, we knew that there was a problem coming. So that's part of our current issue. In 2020, about 160 people left. Um, many of them were in the middle of their careers. That's unique. That does not happen very often. We're talking like out of state or moving. Uh, other agencies. We yeah. lost a lot of people to like Clark County okay. or Clackamas County, Vancouver, or whatever yeah. else. Um, and so that was a problem. Um, and those people are hard to replace. Now I will say it's important to note about half of those people came back. Okay. Um, but we, we still had this huge, uh, retirement boom. Um, every agency in the country is struggling with recruiting, um, law enforcement experienced 
a pretty, again, sentinel moment in 2020 where people, a lot of people who historically would consider law enforcement mm. second guess that now, just given all of the the amount of scrutiny. Um, you know, in Portland here, we're talking about different accountability models where you just, it's a job. Mm -hmm. um, it's always interesting. People seem to forget that police officers are just people right. and police work is a job. Yeah. And if you just think about, I need to make a decision about having a job to support my family. Stability matters, not going to jail matters, you know, wanting to make sure you have like just a fair system. Mm -hmm. So that's real. Um, we hired 20 people last month. I think we're hiring again, 20 people this month. Um, the reality is, is that we're still navigating an attrition that's mostly now attached to retirements. Mm -hmm. We're two years ago, we were plus 30. Last year, we were minus nine. This year, I think we're going to be minus a lot because um, we, we like we're down to the last couple of huge groups. Okay. Um, but it's incumbent on this new form of government, uh, on people who are paying attention to conversations about our accountability systems, that we're creating an environment where people can actually come here and work and not feel like it's going to be mm -hmm. short um, because they're going to get politically destroyed. Yeah, just um, to... Right. So, I, I mean, I, I will tell you, I I mean, I, I've been I'm generationally attached to the Portland Police Bureau. Um, overwhelmingly, the people here are great. Um, the benefits and the pay are good, but the environment, the working conditions are, uh, have always been the big hang up for people. Mm -hmm. And that's where we've got to make sure as a community, we're supporting the people who sign up for the work that we're setting clear standards. Um, I mean, when I was on patrol, uh, in East precinct years ago, our minimums on afternoons were 24 ish people. That number is like 17 now. And they're very often six or seven under that. Mm we're doing a disservice to our community with the amount of people we have. So we've got to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And then also in the meantime, it's going to take us a couple of years at least to kind of restore those numbers. Mm -hmm. We've got to be really honest about what services we can be excellent at and give people options because when, whenever a Portlander has some kind of thing happen, they deserve good service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I've heard from, I don't know. It's just going to take like a decade to rebuild, but you know, it takes time. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Big, I mean, at the end of the day, I think where voters have control over how long that piece takes, mm -hmm. when you have candidates who are still openly discussing like disproven realities, yeah, it makes it pretty difficult. And again, just it was, I mean, just to beat the dead horse, but I mean, you you watch the city council meeting when they're talking about this new uh, rapid response team, six people showed up and said the same tropes that you've heard, just the same kind of stuff. Um, and the news coverage was community members are concerned, right? There was six people. I mean, are there legitimate concerns? Absolutely. Let's talk about them. Let's navigate them. Let's be honest about what happened. But, <laughs> but when, when, when does that news... deserve a headline? I don't know. Yeah. Well, and again, I mean, the framing <laughs> of the conversation is so important. And so, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you, you, you walk around East Portland and you talk to people. That's not what they're saying. Right. I go to community meetings all the time. They're not like, gosh, I, I'm really concerned about that. They're like, yeah. they're like, can you please help me with this problem? What what resources can you provide me? And totally. again, so it's just, I I, I was gonna say, I, I've, it's the same thing on this show. I've done like forty episodes, but I've never. I always hear about the same livability problems. Yeah, it doesn't include, hey, let's abolish the police or we don't need more police. It's always the opposite of that. From what yeah, I hear, and but. most of the, and again, what's what's too bad is a lot of the suggestions you hear for people are things we've done 20 years ago, yeah. and that's pretty hard to hear for people because again, if you spend 10, 15 years being really active around an issue that actually isn't an issue, mm -hmm. that's a challenge. Now, again, that's it, it, what role does law enforcement, does the PPA, does the police bureau, does the city play in not educating their public well enough, not being transparent enough that people don't understand what's happened. Um, you know, again, what role does the news media have in ensuring people can't be gaslit? Yeah. Um, I was, I was going to mention it bugs me, somebody who spent a lot of time in the press. Cause like, I do think there's a, there's a new wave of people who came in are very young in that yeah. industry. And they, I think there's definitely a bias against po oh my pro gosh. police coverage. Um, and that was even the case when I was in there like 10 years ago, but it's even worse now. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. No, hundred percent. And I mean, it's, it's, it's funny cause every news station has kind of a specific bent and I spend a lot of time talking to them. But I mean, you can see individual reporters and it's funny because I think, you know, most news stations in Portland, their actual anchors are people who have been here forever. Right. But Jeff the, Gianola, I used yeah, to work right. with. Yeah. Um, and, and so, I mean, that, that's a good example, but you know, 
Jeff is a very uh, logical human being. I've always found mm -hmm. him to be very fair. Ken Body just did the oh Ken Body's incredible DA debate. Yeah, yeah um, but it's funny because you then you'll see the reporters like in you know the 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 actual people on the desk have to just read what's on the screen. Hey, they we're tossing to this person, mm -hmm. and then you listen to just like really biased information, mm -hmm. and it's got to be kind of frustrating for the people who are like that's not. But okay, yeah, here we yeah. are. Um, well, like the example you pointed to, this you know that city council meeting like a fair reporter would say like hey there's like a handful of people that are concerned with this and then on the other side there's a whole community of people who you know well and listen this and, and, and again like so six people does not a consensus make for one but for two what did all the the electeds say right it was a 5-0 vote and four of the five gave a pretty impassioned speech from all different political spectrums mm -hmm. about why and we need this thing represented. Yeah. Um, you heard the mayor say, you know, violence is not free speech. You've heard me say that a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, you heard one guy come up and start talking about, I mentioned this earlier, but ta start talking about how much money we've, we've paid in these settlements, which again, it, it is a bit of a straw man argument, but you heard commissioner Gonzalez call him back to the dais and say, hold on a second. I want to correct the record on that. Mm. That's it. Not common, right. um, but yeah. nobody covered that. Why? Right. I mean, why why are we not discussing the real discussion, mm -hmm. which is that the vast majority of Portlanders want their city back? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had one very prominent human being say he's like, it's not an issue of is it Rome is burning. People are leaving. Our, our, our businesses are hemorrhaging. But I drove my daughter into the city yesterday to go to the doctor. And she goes, Dad, the city is so beautiful. Mm. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> and it's very frustrating because she used to come down here all the time, mm -hmm. but I, I I don't now. Why? I don't even know why. It's reflexive, right? We need to get that out of people. But the only way we do that is by telling the truth. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just, just tell the truth about what's happening? Yeah. It's very frustrating. And it is true. I was just thinking, I, I worked with a real young person who I was talking to like a week ago and she was like, I never go to Portland anymore. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my wife and I, I come know. down here all, I mean, like, look, I'm just I, like, I live here. But yeah. Well, and I, I, and look, I mean, every time I drive around Portland, I'm reminded that we have amazing food, amazing coffee, amazing ice cream, um, and we have uh, just beautiful parks and beautiful people, and everyone's on edge. Yeah, and, and I, that, I think I'm just numb to it. But yeah, you know. but it's like, but the, the the on edge piece of it, it's just it's. I mean, and I I travel a lot, and you go to other cities, and it's funny because even like so DC. I mean, DC is statistically far more violent than Portland, mm -hmm. but it's not my community. And so when I'm in DC, I mean, you have like, you know, United States representatives getting carjacked right. in the Navy yard area. Well, every time I'm in DC, I go down, there's good restaurants down there. And, I, and I've never, ever thought to myself, ah, I'm going to get carjacked because mm. it's just not relevant to me. Right? right. But I'm far more likely to be a victim of a crime there than I am here. Mm. But that's not the point. I know everything here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it really is like, like people who live here are in it Yeah. and they're reminded of it every day. And you said something earlier that stuck with, what did you say? Emotional emotional safety safety yeah so in that i mean again you, you we, the the motto of the portland police bureau you know trying to to address crime and the fear of crime the fear of crime piece is really difficult you have people who have never been victims of crime before mm -hmm. who not only have been now but all their friends have totally, totally right and so and it's in pockets but then you're like oh my gosh and so then it feels like something's really wrong you know we've had a, a, a handful of homicides down on the waterfront mm -hmm. and and again i don't know anything about those cases but what i do know is that people see that mm -hmm. and it it sticks with you and then, you know, I mean, we, so, uh, we have a, a union picnic, um, and we, we have it in Portland and this last year it was really well attended, but the two years prior, nobody wanted to come because nobody wanted to bring their kids into mm -hmm. a place in Portland. That was a collective. Cause like, if anyone finds out about it, the people are going to show up and protest. Totally. Yeah. That's never happened. Honestly, that wouldn't shock me if it happened, but right. I mean, but the point being is that people, when they don't feel safe. They make decisions with their wallets. They make decisions with their presence. And that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I always tell people, I work up in downtown Vancouver yeah. and I see that <laughs> they're gaining a lot of what Portland used to have, yeah. uh, voting with their wallet kind of thing. But, um, okay. Let's get into this, these last silly questions. Um, or actually you kind of did it. Is there anything else you want to add to your Northwest story? Like, cause you basically grew up here, right? Is that kind of. Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up, um, I grew up and moved out of Portland when I was nine, and then I went to uh, to school in Camas. Um, it's not much more interesting there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're a Northwesterner. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I've lived. I mean, I I grew I grew up here. I went to college at George Fox. Okay. In yeah. Newburgh, I've never lived anywhere else. Um, nice, yeah. So this has been my whole world. Cool. 
Um, all right. Let's say you're parking uh, in a standard painted line spot. Yeah. You pull in or you back in? Do I? Yeah. Uh, it depends on if it's in an angle or not. Okay. Uh, and I have I have a truck and I have a car. I had to buy a commuter when I got this job. Um, I back in with my truck. Okay. Because it's long. You got a nice backup camera on the thing. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I mean I I used to drive a police car, so I'm pretty good at uh, yeah at maneuvering. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. My my little commuter car has more cameras than anyone's really? ever seen, so yeah. I, I I pull in with that because you really can't get hit with okay. anything. But the truck I back in. Okay. Um. Maybe you can confirm this too. If somebody told me that I think it's on like Southwest First or Second, there's an angled parking where it says you have to back in downtown. Do you know anything about that? I've seen those. I don't understand why it says that. And I, I almost wonder if it's just because they don't want people backing out into a through into like a throughway that takes mm, that could be yeah too much time. I still I haven't checked it out, but I was curious. Okay. Um which fruit do you think you could throw the farthest? Which fruit? Well, you want something that's I would say probably something like an apple. Mm -hmm. Uh because you don't I mean you want something that is baseball like. Baseball like and yeah. dense. Yeah. People always say apple or orange, one of those, two, or like plum or like something like that. You know, plum's good. Uh, if you had a non-ripe peach, mm -hmm. it's like a rock. Work. Yeah. <laughs> or nectarine, maybe. Nectarine. I've never so heard here's that the, So here's the debate, right? Does the fur on the peach mm. create kind of res air resistance? So I'm going to go with a nectarine, okay. a non-ripe nectarine. I've never heard that one. That's good. I like that. Um. <laughs> And I don't know the answers to any of these. I, yeah. I always say banana and people think I'm crazy, but I don't know. I feel like I, this centrifugal force could just force that thing. But I'm thinking like a video game, I think. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, are you peanut butter? Are you crunchy, crunchy, smooth peanut butter? I what? prefer crunchy, but my kids prefer smooth. Okay. And I don't eat very much peanut butter. And so as a result, I don't really get what I want. But I think that's yeah. kind of parenting in a nutshell. I've heard that a lot from parents. They like They don't get to... It's wherever yeah. the kid wants to get it. Yeah. Well, because the problem is if I buy a thing of peanut butter that's crunchy, it takes like two years to eat it because I really don't eat that much peanut yeah, butter. Yeah. I love it, but I just don't. I just not like in my normal repertoire. And you go stir, no stir. I don't like the stir stuff. I feel like you like I have found that all the stir peanut butter, it's really good like the first two times. And then it turns into some weird cement like mixture. Yeah, I don't like it either. Um, uh, let's say you're getting ice cream, salt and straw or somewhere. You go cone, waffle cone, cup. Uh, the correct answer is waffle cone. Waffle cone. Yeah. That's like the, yeah, the most. But it has to be a good, one. I mean, it has to be well made and made there. It's not a, out of a box or yeah, something. Yeah, I don't want yeah. it out of a box. <laughs> okay. The best ice cream cone though, I will say I have to defend the honor. Uh, Sugar pine. Sugar pine, okay. Their drumstick. Like they make like a. They make their own, yeah. It's out of bounds. Okay. That is the, and I, I don't even. I'm, I've never I'm, heard of it. Sh I am shamelessly endorsing that. It is the best. I love drumsticks. I'm Dude. Yeah. Sugar Pine has a it, it, it all homemade, and they also you can get like this kind of peanut butter stuff put on it that is like mm -hmm. like a like it's like a butterfinger. It's out of bounds. And where I don't even know where that is. It's in Troutdale. Okay, it is like I've had I, I've gone to every. I mean, there's a lot of really good like what is it? Cloud City down here is Cloud really City, good. Yeah. Um. All I mean, all the all the big ones are good, but like to me, Cloud City is the best like non regular place. Right. But that Sugar Pine drumstick, <laughs> it's. It's, that sounds good. Yeah, it's out of bounds. It's yeah. like a meal, but it's out of bounds. Okay, I'll check that out. Um, when it comes to French fries, you go curly fry, crinkle cut, regular fry, waffle fry. If you have a favorite, type. I like curly fries. Curly fries are awesome, dude. Yeah. I'm right there with you. They're kind of like like a combination of beer battered fries, but then also just it's a lot of good surface area, and I'm, I like uh, barbecue sauce. So you gotta okay yeah. that combo. Yeah, yeah. I. This is making me sound really disgusting, but I will buy Jack in the Box purely because they have curly fries sometimes. That seems reasonable. You have to go get the curly fries. But, um, this is a new question I've never asked. If you had to pick a gigantic brand to run, is there one that you would want to... Brand? Yeah, like Nike or something. Or... It wouldn't be a clothing company. Okay. I want to be something that was travel related. Travel? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean... Like an airline or something? Or? No, I mean, like, like just something that would be, I mean, something like Frommers or something where you could okay. go and, like, just tour places. Either that or, I mean, I used to write, um, being a food critic. I'm, like, I'm like a full-on food nerd. So That's I'm like, cool. Like, I, I've been to every restaurant in Portland multiple times. Like, I just, I, I love, like, so, like, Con, which is the hardest ticket in town, at okay. least it, it was for a long time. 
um, I just feel like cultures communicate through food. Mm -hmm. um, it's like you think about it. If you ever go anywhere, even if you go to like the poorest area in the world, if you if you're a visitor there and you're a welcomed visitor there, they're going to give you the absolute best thing they have um, because that's how cultures communicate. Mm -hmm. um, but like Khan, the thing that was crazy for me is all of the recipes. You, you I mean you look at they're things that you would get in someone's grandma's house. Um, but he's, you know, Gorday just chef the heck out of them. Mm. Um, but when you eat it, you're transported to that place. And that to me is the beauty of, of. That's food. cool. It's like a comfort food. Yeah. Like he's got this, right. He, he's got this rice thing. I don't, it's, it's, it's like steeped in mushrooms and stuff. It's just, it's mm. out of bounds. That's funny. I didn't know you did the writing uh, thing. That's cool. Um, I always ask people like, you kind of just said, but is there a local, did you have a good meal recently you want to shout out? Local place or anything? Uh, well, the most recent place I went was Asina, um, Italian food. I like that place a lot. Okay. Um, it's good Italian food. Um, that's the most recent place we went. Um, we like going to, uh, there's a, uh, the Hive in Oregon City. They have a, a speakeasy below it that's new that mm -hmm. I like. Okay. Um, where else? Uh, Lilia Comador was, we went there not too long ago. Uh, he's doing really interesting things. Uh, it's kind of a Mexican fusion kind of corner. I just... At the end of the day for food for me, like I said, I want to go, I like watching people cook. So when you have like a chef's table for one, but for two, just like understanding the culture behind why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it seems kind of stupid to say con cause con everyone wants to go there. The food there is insane. I mean, it's just, it's. Yeah. I don't even know. You're way, I, you're way more of a foodie than me. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, I've seen this good. It's really good. I'll have to check food. out all these places. Yeah. yeah. Um, Cool. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we wrap it up here? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, I mentioned it a couple of times. We have a couple of ballot measures yeah. um, that we are, we've pushed through. It's been really interesting um, watching the manifestation of um, the reticence of some of the groups in Portland to have, you know, allow voters to have real conversation. I think the thing that's really interesting too is like, so you look at measure 110, um, basically everything that passed in 2020, people voted with their souls. They really wanted to see change. Um, and the challenge is, is that when you're legislating by initiative for one or for two, when things are kind of incomplete, you, you don't really have the, the ability to bring everyone to the table who's involved. Um, but the two most important things for us right now are a ensuring that we have a woven public safety system, um, that we have drop off centers to get people help, mm -hmm. that we have a, a relationship with PSR and other partners. Um, so that's our first ballot measure is just making sure that people have connection, um, to a funded public safety system that, you know, recruits good police officers, but also recruits all the other things that, that weave public safety together. And the other is on the accountability commission conversation. Um, robust public uh, uh, community-based oversight is critical, um, but it's also critical that it's bound in due process. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think anyone that paid attention to that conversation uh, saw that you know there was bias baked into that cake mm -hmm. um, and that's manifested itself. And so, our hope is to ensure that that the public has access to the discipline system here, that they're a part of our training, that they're a part um, of just this robust conversation, but that also the city maintains its ability to navigate its its employees so that we can actually hire good people. Mm -hmm. um, so this conglomerate of bills is set up to just address recruiting retention and a woven public safety model that will make our city better. Um, and this so, is, yeah, November coming up on the... Yeah, so I mean, right now, uh, in, in the ACLU filed challenges to both of them, uh, which again, I, I, I mentioned to the Willamette Week, I find it peculiar that the um, that the ACLU is concerned about voters having an access to a, a conversation. Um, I think you know one conversation I saw was that the current accountability model is set up like a jury. Um, but it's important to remember that if somebody is biased, they can't serve on a jury. Um, and mm, so we mm. want to, again, we want to make sure that that conversation is, is had. Um, but as soon as we get through uh, the conversation here, we hope to push out to, to signatures and get it to voters. Um, the hope initially was just to have city council take up the issue. Mm -hmm. That was what brought it to us in the first place. But um, at the end of the day, it is clear that the conversation around public safety needs to be had, um, you know, had, legislature not acted it's very clear that a ballot measure would have been brought on measure 110 um, in the absence of legislature or the city council bringing anything on public safety we need to have this conversation mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we're hoping to do cool yeah yeah i hope so too um yeah thanks so much for doing this this was yeah good conversation yeah yeah 
Thanks for having me.